Uh, let me begin by noting, and this, this is something that many students who don't know the philosophy and theology of late antiquity never, never learn, actually. It's often omitted. There's an all but untranslatable distinction in the way the word theos, God, was used in late antiquity by Greek-speaking intellectuals. That is, the old Greek way of speaking of the Most High God, God in the most proper sense, was to refer to him by the definite article, the, the God, o theos. While a God or a divine thing could simply be called a theos. Now this distinction wasn't always hard and fast, but in Christian usage for many centuries, and to be honest, as is still the case to some degree in the ancient liturgies still employed by, say, the Greek and Melkite communions, the name Otheos is generally applied only to the Father, while Christ, or occasionally the Spirit, was more cautiously called, more cautiously called Theos. Why is this important? Well, let me, I'm going to get technical here for a moment, but it's all to a good end, and I'll make some jokes along the way if you want to lighten it up. In the intellectual world of the first three centuries before Nicaea, before the Council of Nicaea, which gave us the inchoate form of the Nicene Creed, it would be added to in later years, especially in the eastern half of the empire, there was something we might call a, a logos metaphysics that was a, a crucial part of the philosophical lingua, lingua franca of almost the entire educated class, pagan, Jewish, Christian, even Gnostic though the word used was not always logos. And certainly this was the case in Alexandria. For the Hellenistic Jewish philosopher Philo, for instance, the term logos referred to a kind of secondary divinity, a divine son mediating as a principle between God the Most High and creation. The pagan Platonists believe, <laughs> it wasn't me, in the ultimate divine principle, the one was and that it was utter, in its utter transcendence, uh, it, it could not be related to the world except through a, a lesser derivative divine principle or principles. In late antiquity, it was assumed widely in pagan, Jewish, and Christian circles too, especially in Alexandria, which was the intellectual center of the, of, of, of the world, of the, of, the, of, the, of the late empire, uh, that God in his full transcendence never came into direct content with the world of finite, immutable things. And so it expressed himself in a subordinate and e economically reduced form through whom? Through whom? In the creed, diaftu, or dialtu, if it says. He created and governed the world. It was this logos that many Jews and Christians believed to be the subject of all the divine theophanies of Hebrew scripture. Therefore, you could say, yes, Moses saw God or the back of God, depending which passage you're reading, but of course God is not visible, God in the most proper sense. What was seen was the, was the logos, God's self-expression in a subordinate being. Um, many of the early Christian apologists thought of God's logos as having been generated from the Father just prior to creation in order to act as an artisan and arch-regent of the created order. In short, the idea of a derivative or secondary divine principle was, was a premise shared by all the city's native schools of Trinitarian reflection and by Hellenized Jews and Platonists, middle and late. And one could describe all these systems without any significant exception, pagan and Jewish, no less than Christian, as subordinationist in structure. That is, there is the most high God, and then there are subordinate divine principles that are less than the most high. All of them attempted with greater or lesser complexity and with more or less vivid mythical adornments to connect the world here below to its highest principle by populating the interval in between with various intermediate degrees of spiritual reality. 